Hello, this is take two, I guess, on the Sunday school lesson for this week. Uh, I was in the midst when I got a phone call, and so I'm going to get to start over since I don't know how to splice or do any of those fancy things. Uh, this is Carolyn Weston, and I am adult Sunday school teacher at Walnut Creek Baptist Church. Our church is doing all of our services and everything online right now, and so um, I am going to teach our lesson. And last week, there were several who... Uh, watched the lesson that were not from our church, from outside our church, and so I thought I'd give a little bit better introduction this week. Um, we uh, are Southern Baptist Church. I just teach a Sunday school class. I don't have any special knowledge or anything. I just pray that the Lord guides me, and I would ever not ever say anything that would not be uh, according to His Word. We use Explore the Bible series from LifeWay, which is a Bible book series where we study one book at a time. Uh, we are in the book of Romans right now. We started a couple of weeks ago with chapter 1, and we are in chapter 3 this week. I, um, I might go back and just uh, remind us just a tiny bit of... Uh, what we learned in chapter 1 and 2, very briefly, kind of God's uh, wrath in chapter 1 and chapter 2. Paul is writing to the church in Rome. He's trying to unite the Jews and the Gentiles there. And um, chapter 1, he, he kind of talked a little bit about uh, some of the depravities. that He uh, talked about homosexuality. He talked about... Um, they're worshiping the created instead of the creator, and uh, that that was not good, and that for that reason, God had turned them over to their depravities. And then last week, uh, he talked about pride and boasting and uh, made sure that they understood that the Jews, just because they had been designated the chosen people, uh, did not have... Uh, exclusive rights to God, and that the Gentiles, even though they did not have the law and the scripture, and that they did not have an excuse either, that we all stand before God in need of salvation, and that uh, he is the same God for all of us, and uh, that one or the other, we all come to, to him the same and equally. Um, so today's lesson actually starts in verse 21 of chapter 3, but I cannot um, begin to start on, on verse 21 without going back to verse 20. I think verse 20 is kind of the foundation for everything that we study today. It's just, it's pivotal in what we study today. I think we have to understand the concept of that verse before we can go into um into today's studies. So let me go back to uh, to verse 20, but I want to start us with prayer, and then we will begin the lesson. Heavenly Father, I thank you and I praise you that you allow us to come together in your name, that you allow us to come before your throne with our needs, our wants, our cares, our concerns, and Father, to give you praise and glory that you deserve and we can't even come close to giving you what you deserve. Father, I lay our nation, I lay our, our people, our world before you today and, and pray for your mercy and your guidance at this time of uh, unique and unprecedented times. But Lord, you are in control and we praise you for that. Lord, I pray that you use all of this to your glory and your honor, the all the way from the coronavirus to everything that's going on, Father, to this lesson that we study today. So, Father, we love you and we praise you and we ask you for your forgiveness in everything that we do that falls short of your measure for us. And we pray all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So, to begin today's lesson, I want to start with the verse prior to where our materials actually start for today's lesson. And that is with verse 20 of chapter 3. And it says, Therefore, no one will be declared righteous in his sight by observing the law. Rather, through the law, we become conscious of sin. And I think that is, to me, that is the purpose of the law, um, for us especially. It is the purpose of the law. Jesus said he came to fulfill the law, not to do away with the law. And so he fulfilled the need for sacrifice, the need for all of the things because we could not keep the law. He became that perfect sacrifice, but he did not do away with the law. And so to me, the purpose of the law, and I think what this is saying, the purpose of the law 
is to make us to make us conscious of our sin. And so no way, as it says in the first part of that verse, uh, that no one will be declared righteous um, in God's sight because we can keep the law. We can't do that. But the law can make us, make us conscious of our sin, which makes us realize how much we need God, how much we need his plan that does make us righteous before him so that we can come before him, that we can enjoy eternity with him. And so let's, uh, let's go in now to verses 21 through 23. I want to just break these down individually um, so that we'll get lost in them. Um, Verse 21 says, But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. So he's saying now the righteousness of God is um, without the law is being manifested. Um, we know that the law cannot save us. God is, is the law. He is above the law. He created the law. So his, his righteousness is far above all of that. And it's saying here that the righteousness of God without the law is manifested. Manifested means to be made so clear, so evident. And so the, the law witnesses to that. Uh, that's, I think, what that verse 20 is saying, that uh, the law makes us conscious. It's a witness to sin. It says, it, it tells us the truth. A witness is someone who's sworn to tell the truth. And so the law is sworn to tell the truth. And so the law makes us conscious of our sin. And uh, so the righteousness of God without the law is manifested. God is, his righteousness is manifested. He does not need the law because he is the law. He created the law. He's above the law. And even the prophets and the law testify to that. And so to me, that's that, that consciousness that the law gives us that makes us realize that our, we have no righteousness um, before God. And then in that next verse, it says, Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, unto all and upon all them that believe, there is no difference. This verse is packed full of things. Again, going back to the situation where Paul was. He was, uh, he was talking to a church that, uh, that needed unity. All churches need unity. Our countries need unity. Um, a house divided cannot stand. We've, we've all learned that phrase. And so this church needed unity, just like we all need unity. And he was saying this, this faith that I'm talking about, this righteousness, even the righteousness of God, which is uh, by faith in Jesus Christ, is available to all. So he's stressing that all. It is unto all and upon all. So it's available to everyone. It's for everyone. And he was trying to stress that to the Jew and to the Gentile. And so I think to put it more in our terms, um, we all need this faith. It's for all of us. It doesn't matter if we're Russian or American. It doesn't matter if we're Democrat or Republican. It does not matter if we are from the Northern Hemisphere or the Southern Hemisphere, whether we're rich, whether we're poor. It doesn't matter. We all need this righteousness that is available through faith in Jesus Christ. It doesn't matter if we are a Billy Graham who you know, we respect and, and think of as being this great man of God or whether we are a Hitler who we look at and we just think that he is just the lowest thing that ever, you know, walked on the face of the earth. We all need this righteousness before God that is available through Christ Jesus. And there's no other way to get it. And then listen, why, he tells us why. He tells us why we all need it and why it is for all of us. It says in verse 23, we, we learned this verse as children as we, learned the, as we learned that Roman road to salvation. This is one of those, this is like that first verse in that Roman road to salvation. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So um, just as he said in that verse above, it's for this faith for righteousness is for all, and there is no difference. Jew or Gentile, Hitler, Billy Graham, there is no difference. And so he says all, this same group, everybody, all inclusive, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We've all done it. No one can stand before God. 
guiltless. We have all done it. We have all sinned. We did not measure up is basically what this is saying. Our sin causes us not to measure up. Um, and so that law that makes us conscious of our sin also shows us how holy and righteous that God is, but how unrighteous we are and how desperately we need something that comes in and bridges that gap between us and this holy, righteous God. And he's saying that faith in Jesus Christ is what bridges that gap, and it's available to all. It's for all of us, Jew or Gentile, Hitler or good guy, doesn't matter. It's available to all of us. So um, impossible to earn our stance before God with, with the law. It must be through faith in Jesus Christ. And then this next verse, basically Paul says, but there's a fix for that. There's a fix for that. We've all sinned. We've all fallen short. None of us measure up, but there's a fix for that. So in verse 24, he says, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Justified freely. We can't buy it. We cannot earn it. Nothing we can do can get us that justification that we need. It's a free gift. But just because he loves us, it is a free gift. And so being justified freely by his grace. But just because he says we're justified freely doesn't mean that it's just dished out here. Everybody that walks by, he's dishing out this free justification. It's through faith. It is through faith. Um, not everybody that sins is going to be justified, but it is available. We all have access to it. It's not withheld from anyone. We all have access to it. And so when we, we, can, we don't deserve it, we deserve his judgment. But when we have that faith in Christ Jesus, that redemption that comes through Christ Jesus, it is freely handed out because of our faith in him. So God's unmerited love, it's his plan, it's his free justification that he gives us through redemption that's in Christ Jesus. Can't earn it. We were guilty. We deserve judgment. And yet he basically wipes our slate clean and says, you're pardoned. I, I forgive you. You're pardoned. Here's this free justification. You can now stand before me. You can stand with me. You can spend eternity with me. Um, that word um, uh, redemption there is a term, uh, it says, like they used when Frey, if, if a slave had been bought and then set free. And so we've been bought with a price. We've been redeemed. We, um, the, it wasn't just, it was a pardon for sure, but it, but it wasn't free. The redemption cost a high price. It cost Jesus to become that sacrifice. Uh, as we're going to learn in this next verse, what, what that sacrifice was, um, his blood for our, his, his blood for ours, basically. And so we can stand before him redeemed. Our price has been paid. Our, our sin debt has been forgiven because it's been paid for. We could not afford it. We couldn't do it, but it was, it was redeemed for us in Christ Jesus. And then in verses 25 and 26, it says, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of God to declare, I say, at this time his righteousness that he might be just and that the just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. So let's go back up to verse 25. It says, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation. A propitiation means an instead of. I, I remember a, a preacher one time preaching that and say, saying, if you can't remember anything else, just remember that it was instead of. So Jesus was our instead of. Instead of me, it was him. Um, another definition of that is an appeasing substitute. He became our substitute. He was our instead of. He was our substitute. He appeased God in our stead. Um, he regained God's favor for us. We, Through sin, we fell out of favor with God. And so Jesus became that appeasing substitute. 
that can regain our favor with God. He stands in that gap between us and God as a propitiation instead of. And then look what it says. To be a, propiti a propitiation through faith in his blood. Our faith in the cross, our faith in Jesus' blood is what puts him in the gap between us and God. He's, that's what bridges that gap between us and God. He was the perfect sacrifice. He was, um, his blood was sinless. He was the unblemished lamb. And we had nothing to offer. Nothing to offer. There was no sacrifice that we could offer that could pay for our sin until Jesus came along. And look at back in the very beginning of that verse, and it says, whom God hath set forth. God is the one that instigated this plan. We didn't come to God and say, God, we need a plan. We need a plan. We need you to devise a way to, uh, to bridge the gap between us and you because sin has divided us from you. There's this, this chasm between us. Sin has divided us from you. We need, we need a bridge to you. God said, I will make a bridge for you. We didn't have to go to him. He knew since the foundation of the world what the plan was going to be. He knew before we ever existed what the plan was going to be. And so God's plan, his plan from the beginning of time, and it's his plan alone. It wasn't our plan. It was his plan. And he knew that Jesus would be our substitute and so that perfect blood of Jesus Christ becomes our sacrifice. It was his blood for ours because we were guilty. We were, we were sinful. And so it should have been our blood, but it was not. It says, through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins. So it is his righteousness through his blood that we get the remission of sins, not through anything that we can do of ourselves. And it says of sins that are past. You know, sin had been happening since the Garden of Eden. Sin had been happening since the beginning of time, it was the beginning of humankind. And so there, Jesus is the bridge of that gap also. Yes, they tried to keep the law. Yes, they did sacrifices. They did everything they could. But Jesus brought about a new age of forgiveness. No longer did they have to look forward to a Messiah that would be their savior. The Messiah had come, and that saving grace had come. And so it says, even for the sins of the past, that are past. So the sins from the beginning of time, the sins from the Garden of Eden to the time of Jesus' death were forgiven. And now we live under the grace that comes from the cross. God's plan through the cross. And then he says, to declare, I say, at this time his righteousness, that he, God, that he might be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. And so this is saying, God is just. God is a just God, but he's a merciful God. Thank goodness he's a merciful God. Because if all we had was the just part of God and we got what we deserved, we would all be doomed. We would all be damned. And so we don't. Through his mercy, through his grace, he sent Jesus Christ. And so... Because God is just, then he becomes the justifier of him, which is us, which believe in Jesus Christ. He becomes the justifier of us when we believe in Jesus. When we place our faith in God's plan, which was Jesus Christ, then God justifies us through his blood, through his sacrifice. That's, that's God's plan. And so... Our part of that is to believe, to have faith, to believe in him and to trust in him. Um, our, our security is in him. Our security is in belief in Christ and belief in the cross and belief in God's plan. And then in verse 27 and 28, he says, where is boasting then? Remember, we talked last week about that boasting because the Jews were boasting. Ah, we're the ones that have been given the scriptures, the law. And so Paul is saying, where is boasting then? And he says, it is excluded. By what law? <laughs> what of works? And then he goes on, he says, nay, but by the law of faith. 
Therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. And so he's, he's saying, where, where's your boasting then? If, if all of this is true, where's your boasting? Is it in the law? Is it in your works? <laughs> no way. No way. Uh-uh. You don't have it. You have nothing to boast about. There is nothing that we can do that is boastable. Nothing. We, no matter how good our works are, no matter how hard we try, no matter how much we study, no matter how much we pray, no matter how much we witness, it doesn't matter. We have nothing that is worthy of boast, boastfulness. The only thing that we have is the grace of God, his mercy and his love and his plan of the cross for us so that we might be justified through Jesus Christ. Jesus fulfilled the law, and so by faith, we're justified through him. Um, we just, we cannot boast of anything that would get us in right standing with God. We remember it said we're justified freely. We're justified freely. We're, it's not passed out. You have to have faith, but everyone has access to that justification through faith in Jesus Christ. So that was God's plan. Now, Paul is kind of going back here again to the idea of, uh, of unity in the church there. And he said, and because they were, it was almost that, well, this is our God. No, this is our God kind of thing going on. So he's saying, is he the God of the Jews only? Is he not also of the Gentiles? Yes, of the Gentiles also. Seeing it is one God which shall justify the circumcision by faith and the uncircumcision through faith. Do we then make void law the, through faith? God forbid, yea, we establish the law. And so he's saying back here in verse 29, he says, um, is God the God of the Jews only? No, we know that's not true. Is God the God of the Jews only? Is he not also the God of the Gentiles? That's what Paul is asking. He asks these rhetorical questions often. And when he knows the answer and he knows that you know the answer, he's saying, is God the God of the Jews only? Or is he all, but is he not God of the Gentiles also? And then he answers his own question. He says, yes, yes, he is. He's of the Gentiles also. So seeing he is one God, there's just one God. One God, one way. One God, one way. Seeing he is one God, which shall justify the circumcision by faith and the uncircumcision through faith. He's saying there's one God and there's one way. The circumcised, of course, were the Jews and the uncircumcised were the Gentiles. And he's saying, so we just need unity in this. There's no reason to be taking sides. There's no reason for argument. We all come to the same God by the same path. And that path is through faith in Jesus Christ. That was God's plan. And that's the only way to God. It's the only way for justification. It's the only way that God recognizes. And so we all come by that same way, whether Jew or Gentile, whether the good guy or the bad guy, whether the Republican or the Democrat, whether the Jew or the Gentile, it does not matter whether we're, it doesn't matter just doesn't matter. We all come to this one God through this one way, and that's it. And then in verse 31, he says, do we then make void the law through faith? God forbid. Yea, we establish the law. Don't know exactly what Paul meant by that there, but I still think it goes back to that concept of the law and the purpose of the law, that the law reveals to us our sin. It makes us conscious of our sin. And so the law is purposeful and not to forget the law. The law is good for us. I mean, think about the things it tells us not to do. It tells us, you know, to keep God in his place and to, to, to worship. It tells us not to covet. It tells us not to lie, to steal, to steal, to cheat, to covet. It tells us not to do those things. It, it, it teaches us how to have a right relationship with God and how to have a right relationship with each other. And, and so the law is good for us, and it's good to obey the law. We just don't, we just shouldn't think that that is what is earning us salvation. That's not what earns us redemption. That's not what justifies us before God. It is good, and he expects us 
to obey the law, to obey what he set forth that was good for us. But he also wants us to understand that our redemption, that our salvation, our justification is a free gift from him and that we should appreciate him and love him and cherish him and cherish that gift that he has given us. And through our love and appreciation of him, then we want to obey the law. We want to keep the law. Um, it shows us how imperfect we are, how perfect he is. Um, we are, um, I may, I may go back and touch on this a little at the end, depends on how long this goes, but we have this innate need to be justified. That's, that's just man's, uh, built-in need. I think God put it in there to make us realize that we need him. And so we have this built-in need to be justified. And, uh, Back uh, in the in chapter one, I think it talked about where we exchange the truth of God for lies. Um, and, it, and it's Isaiah, I think, that says, um, "Woe be unto him who uh, calls evil good and good evil, who changes light for darkness, or darkness for light, and bitter for sweet, and sweet for bitter." I don't remember exactly how it goes, but um, those we have this innate need to um, to be justified. When we're doing something wrong, we justify it. Like we get in an argument or something and we begin to justify, or we're telling somebody our side of this story and we begin to justify ourselves. And so like it said back in chapter one, we, we exchange the truth of God for lies in order to justify ourselves. And so we can't do that. We have to stand before this holy, perfect, just God, and say, mm -mm, I'm just, I'm flawed, and I need your forgiveness. I need, I need your grace, and I need to come to you through the only way that you have created, through the cross, and by that, I put away my lies. I put away all of the ways that I have, this faulty thinking that I have had, and I come before you just um, humble and, and accept by your grace through this faith that I have, however little or big it may be, through this faith that I have, that you have provided this way for me to be justified before you. And I think that's what God is expecting from us. It's through our faith in Jesus Christ, through God's exclusive plan for us, through Jesus Christ. And then um, in this next verse, uh, verse, um, it is, um, it says, what, what shall we say then that Abraham, our father, as pertaining to flesh, hath found? He goes back now and, um, and goes back to um, Abraham. And he, he's going to use Abraham as an example for, um, let me go back here in my Bible and see where that is. Anyway, he's using Abraham as an example of, uh, of faith. He's saying faith just isn't for us now. Faith has always been the way. Yes, they had the law. Yes, they tried to keep the law. Yes, they did sacrifices. But faith has actually always been the way to God. Faith has always been the way that we can come before God and stand before God and have the righteousness before God that we that we need. And so he's, he's remembering and reminding. Remember, he's talking to a lot of Jews. And so they, they know the stories of Abraham. They know about Abraham and his circumcision and his step of faith with that. They know about Abraham and how he was going to sacrifice Isaac. Uh, they know how Abraham left his homeland and headed out for don't even know where just to follow God because God told him that he would take him to this this promised land. And so the Jews knew about Abraham and knew those stories. And so Paul is using this this reminder of Old Testament scripture to prove to them that faith has always been around and that faith has always been the avenue to God. And so um it's always been our key to righteousness. And so let's look now in um, in verses 2 and 3. It says, For if Abraham were justified by works, he hath whereof to glory, but not before God. For what saith the scripture? 
Abraham believed God and it was counted unto him for righteousness. This is saying, you know, if anybody probably could have boasted of their of their righteousness and of their good works, it, it might have been Abraham because he did. He he followed God. He tried to obey God. You know, and sometimes I think we look around and we see people and we we, tr we measure ourselves kind of by other people. And, you know, we look at somebody and say, man, I, well, I'm better than they are. Or, wow, so-and-so is so good. I just don't know how they walk the way they walk with God. And we, we have a tendency to look at each other. We're looking at the wrong people. I don't think we should look at each other. I think we need to look at God. We need to look at Jesus as our perfect example. But either way, you want to take this scripture. You know, Abraham was a pretty good guy. He, um, if anybody could have claimed their own justification through works, um, maybe it could have been Abraham, you know, because he was. He was a good guy. He did try to honor and glorify God and live his life according to God's will. But, but it's saying, it says, you know, if, you know, he was really all that good, maybe. But it says, but not before God. When we come before God, remember, it, the Bible goes on to say, our righteousness are as filthy rags. Our righteousness is as a filthy rag. And so we, we, we cannot stand. Our righteousness, our good works, no matter how hard we try, cannot stand before God. And so that's what he's saying. You know, Abraham, as good as he was, didn't cut it before God. And so it goes on to say, for what saith the scripture? Paul is saying, what does the scripture say about Abraham? What does it say? It says, Abraham believed God and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Abraham believed God. He believed God when he called him out of the land of, of the Chaldeans and said, come and follow me. I'm going to lead you somewhere else. So Abraham uprooted his family, took his family, and off they went. He believed God. When God told him, he said, I am going to make a great nation out of you. Abraham was childless. He was childless. And he said, I'm going to make a great nation out of you. And Abraham believed him. And then Abraham said, I need you to, God told Abraham, I need you to sacrifice your son. And I believe that Abraham believed in his heart that God was going to provide a way. He knew that that was his only heir, his only way to have this nation. And that God would provide him a way. And so Abraham's faith was before the signs. Abraham's faith was before he before he was circumcised. Abraham's faith was before God saved Isaac from sacrifice. Abraham believed God and it was counted to him for righteousness. Was Abraham faithful? Did he believe in God? Did he try to keep the law? Yes, he did. But his act of faith that trust in God. I believe you, God, and I'm going to do whatever you tell me to do. I'm going to trust that you're going to take care of it. That was what counted for Abraham's righteousness. You know, Abraham had some huge acts of faith along his way. Like I said, uprooting his family, heading off to who only knows where, to... Um, demanding or commanding and saying me and all of my men are going to be circumcised to as the signature of the covenant with God those were great acts of faith taking his son up a mountain knowing that his son was to be the sacrifice that's a great act of faith a great act of faith you know faith is a powerful thing and i don't you know we we are not often called to test our faith very often, sometimes in illnesses. And I find out that, you know, my faith is weaker than I would like for it to be sometimes when I am put to the test. But faith is a powerful thing. Faith is what links us to God's power. When we have faith and it's counted to us for righteousness, then we come into the presence of a mighty, holy God. And his power is available to us. Uh, he sent the Spirit when Jesus left this earth. He said, I'm not going to leave you alone. I'm going to send you a comforter. I'm going to send you someone that's going to walk with you.